Good afternoon, everybody. It is so kind of you to come in such a great number for this talk. And uh, we are talking about a very important and very sensitive subject. I ask for your indulgence. I'll be brash, direct, and extremely impolite. Why? Sometimes we have to put facts on the table. And these facts can hurt. But if the surgery is not done, the patient can die. What's our patient? Our patient is our beloved tradition, Korean Buddhism. It has been around for 1,700 years, and uh, we are rightfully worried about its future. If you look at the statistics, Korean Buddhists have been decreasing in number in the last 20, 25 years at such a rapid pace that it's uh, very, very worrisome. Why is this happening? When you go to temples, you see people mostly over age 45, and even more above 60. 95% are women. The rest of them are a few laymen and sunims. This is uh, the current social situation. How did this happen, and uh, what can we do when we watch that the generations change and the elder generations pass on and there's no resupply and there's no new influx of large amount of young people. What went wrong? Well, first let's get back to Shila Dynasty a little bit. Shila Dynasty was very, very much overlapping with the Tang Dynasty in China when Buddhism got big royal support. That's when Buddhism became very high class. This high class is not good, not bad. But if it only stays high class, then it cannot talk to the masses. It becomes elite. After that, in the Yi dynasty, it received a, a cold shower for hundreds of years. And that's when Buddhism, especially meditation practice, went up to the mountains and preserved the sixth patriarch's teaching, Yukcho de Sao Huineng. It is extremely important to see that the greatest value of our Korean Son tradition is this unbroken meditation lineage since it was brought first to Korea 1700 years ago. And after the Yi dynasty, very, very quickly the 20th century came. The Japanese colonial period, then the Korean War, then the Pak chung -hee era, then the new era coming with a lot of presidents that were either Protestants or Catholic. One may have been Buddhist, with a Buddhist background. No more. So where is the royal support for Korean Buddhism? It's gone. Where is the elite? The elite is dying out. Fewer and fewer people actually learn that many Chinese characters that would be necessary to attain the greatest meaning. You see live Chinese characters when the great monks, old monks, they make kushi, they make calligraphy, and everybody loves it. What can we possibly do to maintain the correct appearance and correct function of Korean Buddhism? Well, we should see that much of the effort these days goes into the appearance, because we believe, especially in Korea, due to the Confucianist tradition, the Yukio element in your culture, that appearance is the function itself. That form, the form that we display, is the solution. And the 20th century and, and the 21st also has shown that this is not true. There have been too many upheavals in society and on this earth, too many changes, too much suffering. The old forms, as they are, need to be adapted, not destroyed, adapted. So one key point which links appearance and function is adaptation. How do we adapt to current circumstances? We have to take away most of the old style thinking, old reflections, old social reflexes, very conservative views, that is hindering Buddhism to connect to the new world. 
We have a great tradition. We have fantastic meditators up in the mountains and many high-class ceremony and sutra monks, you know, in our midst. What do we do to adapt the teaching in such a way that it could interface with the current modern world? We have to think different. We have to open up possibilities. We have to involve all those young people who might be interested in Buddhism, but they look at it and they say, it's my grandmother's religion. It's not my cup of tea. So to reinvigorate our tradition, we have to become young again in ourselves. That's what it takes, so that your mind would become beginner's mind again. Practically, how can you do that? Here comes the painful part. Confucianism, Nyukyo, Taoism, Dokyo, and Buddhism, Bulgyo, they fused together for hundreds of years. But this fusion today means that many times this body is paralyzed. And that's when you have to take out all the Confucianist elements that makes up this rigid structure. The structure is very rigid, hierarchy is necessary, but overly conservative and inflexible thinking is not necessary because it's not livable. Lao Tzu in Taoism said, anything which is flexible and supple belongs to the realm of life. Anything which is hard and stiff and inflexible belongs to the realm of death. It's our choice. What do we really want? Do we want to adapt, produce new varieties, and become intelligent again, or we die out like many species during the evolution? Think of history as human evolution, the evolution of our consciousness. Forms that could adapt and stay intelligent, adaptive, versatile, they survived. Those forms that became very rigid, inflexible, unintelligent, non-adaptive, they died out. It's our choice. So, from the inside, as Korean Buddhists, you know way more about your tradition than foreigners. And how can you teach this tradition without all that knowledge to foreigners? The answer is, some of this knowledge is necessary and it can be conveyed and given over. And some of this is just background. It's not necessary. And you should see very clearly how much the foreign student can take and how much they cannot. We have this cup. It's a very nice cup. But if I want to put the entire pitcher of tea into it, it will spill on the floor. I can put in 10%. The other 90 must be there because you don't know which 10% will be necessary. But some will be. <clears throat> I often ask myself, why is Korean Buddhism not as popular as Tibetan? Tibetan Buddhists are everywhere. They are publishing millions of books. Their lamas and geshes and dorjes, they are on the five continents and they enjoy a tremendous amount of popularity. What's missing? The answer is, Korean Buddhism is not missing anything, but it has a lot of extras, including its history, including its fusion with Confucianism and Taoism, and becoming so much of a Korean cultural asset that if you take anybody out of this environment, it's almost impossible for them to teach the essence of this Buddhism the essence of Korean tradition without the culture, without the social environment, without the Confucianist ideas and principles that went into it. Confucianism is not bad. In fact, I like hierarchy. Hierarchy is good, but if hierarchy is inflexible, then airplanes crash, boats sink, there are big accidents and big fires, and you know what I mean. That's when it becomes a matter of life and death. So our practice is not just following the form or some kind of appearance. We must attain the essence of our tradition, which can be conveyed without the cultural background. 
You need that for your support and for your own understanding and for your own studies. You're Korean, you were born into a wonderful society, into Korean body. But when you go abroad, those people don't understand your culture, don't understand your history. And least of all, would they be aware of Confucianism? So they don't understand why bow, why chant, or least of all, why sit. So how do you interface the tradition with Western karma? But just to simplify, just like a good musician, you can improvise. And that improvisation is faithful to the original music, but it's not written down in the notes. It's not a music note. It's your own improvisation based on your own understanding and attainment of the teaching. And that improvisation usually should start with one sentence. How may I help you? How can I really help your problem? Mostly, the question here in Korea is, what do you believe? Do you believe this, 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 or some other religion? And in the West, especially in Europe and America, the question is really not what you believe anymore. We are way past that point. The question is, what do you have in your heart? What kind of psychology you have? What kind of problems you have in your mind that this tradition could help with? That is the question. So if you want to teach the form of Buddhism, if you want to remain with appearances, we do not get to the actual function of helping other people. And if you don't help, then we become useless. If we become useless, we die. It's that simple. So as to teach other people and help other people, we have to perceive their minds, we have to understand their situation. Let me tell you an example. Um, this biography, which you all heard, it needs a little bit of an update. Not just because we registered Won Kwang Sa in the Chogya order in 2012 and stopped our affiliation with the Quantum School of Zen. It's not the only reason. There are many other reasons too. One is that when I got back from Korea in 2000, we had no place to stay except a very small apartment in the Gypsy District of Budapest, District 8. For three years, we stayed there. And we had many interesting encounters with gypsies who were not interested in Buddhism at all because they had no idea what it is. But they were interested in this kind of clothing. They thought I was some kind of Shaolin fighter, some Surin Sasun Tzu, okay? And I kind of looked macho with this bald head and etc., etc. And we were walking, of course, in this kind of clothing, me and my students, I had two monastic students at that time, and soon the third appeared. And in broad daylight, we never wore anything else than this. When we were out in the streets, we always had this kind of clothing on, and in the Zen center, of course, as well. So we got a lot of encounters. And if you live in the jungle, you must know the law of the jungle. If you do not know jungle law, the jungle eats you. If you understand jungle law, you will fit within the hierarchy of the animals there, and then the jungle can even support you. This metaphor is very, very valid in any tribal, indigenous, <clears throat> or closed society. Okay? These are human beings, but our behavior, the atavistic human behavior, based on our own instincts and subconscious tendencies, they have a lot in common with the jungle, okay? So once a guy stopped me, in fact, not one, three. Hey, this thing looks cool. What kind of clothes? <laughs> and I say, well, this is Korean monk's clothing. You have to be brief. You cannot give an academic speech there. That focus is about five seconds especially when it's intellectual stuff. Say, what do you do with this? You fight? I said, yeah, we fight. <laughs> but not with our hands. Not with our body. With the mind. 
Wow, the mind. <laughs> what kind of fight is that? No hand fight, no kicks. I said, you fight your own anger, your own greed, and your own ignorance. And there are people who can win. I said, why would I want to do that? I don't even understand what you're saying. But they were not unfriendly. They were just having their own time. I said, because if you win the fight inside, you do not have to fight outside. Wow. <laughs> this kind of clicked, you know. And uh, I smiled. It was a very natural interaction. And later on they said, well, obviously, if you wanted to protect yourself, you could have some defense, right? I said, yeah, probably I could, but it's not necessary. Then, then they looked at each other, this guy's cool, okay, okay, thank you, let's go, okay. And they went. How important is this? Two months later, same year, except it was the end of summer. My students and me are returning from a Dharma talk, which we gave nearby, and after 11, there is no public transportation in that area. At least 10 years ago, it was like that. And we were walking back after 11 p.m. in the middle of the night, over two kilometers in this district. And of course, there are people outside to control what's going on. So there was a gang in the very square behind which our little Zen center was. And they only saw our bold heads shining in the streetlights. And what happened was one very sharp Hungarian sentence, which went exactly like this. I will not translate this. There are Hungarians who understand this. Right here, right now. But you could feel what this is. It's one of the worst swear words that you can utter. And without one second of a delay, there was another voice from the same gang talking back to this guy. Leave it. I know them. That's what it took. So you see how cause and effect operate. You see very well that if you do the right thing, if you relate to people in the right way, you can not only survive, you can deliver the message. And obviously, we delivered the message because if that guy didn't remember, we would be toast. They would have beaten the heck out of us. And it didn't happen. So this is extreme, but we are not here just to kind of schmooze around with nice and meaningless conversation. I'm giving you the gist of our Western experience, but you don't have to go that far. Here in the Korean subway, at the end of the 90s, with this kind of attire, just a bowing robe or a durmagi, um, I encountered Koreans who didn't like Buddhists. And you can see them, they are around. They don't like Buddhism. They sometimes damage temples. They are aggressive with people. They want you to believe something else than your good old tradition. And one of them was, he was intelligent and on the bus. And he comes up to me and says, why did you leave your good old religion? And then kindly I asked him back, why did you leave your good old religion? No further conversation. Because he, he saw that this is hopeless. It's not going to lead him anywhere. However, uh, on the subway, Sahuson, line number four, never forget that, there was a short little aggressive guy and he spoke English. And he comes up to my face and asks me in the face, what are you doing here, monkey? <laughs> and then if you get offended, if you have opposite thinking, if you have any kind of reactive, ego-based mind, you lose. But our tradition, Yorobon, is great. It teaches you compassionate, wise, non-dualistic consciousness, which is clear like space, clear like a mirror. And that reflects everything. Without any judgment, without checking, wanting, holding, projecting, it's all clear. 
So what can you do in that kind of situation? So as to quote another Hungarian sentence, I spoke to him like this. Tudod, hogyha együttérzően és bölcsességgel teli beszélsz emberekkel, akkor valószínűleg intelligens és együttérző válaszokat fogsz kapni. De hogyha úgy viszonyulsz hozzájuk, ahogy most hallom tőled, előbb-utóbb bajba kerülsz, és nagyon-nagyon sok szenvedéssel fogsz találkozni. Well, he started to look pretty much like some of you in the audience. This total not understanding. And then he just got confused and tried to guess the country where I came from. And he said, huh? Oh, Indonesia? You go? What? Okay. So then he was totally perplexed and he, he started to walk away. And I didn't follow. You don't have to be right. You just have to present yourself. Correct relationship, correct function. And then he walked away. This, ladies and gentlemen, is not about my person, but I have to relay my personal experience. This is about what I learned here in Korea from Sung San Sunim, from all the other monks and nuns and lay people, all the Sabu Dejung, and Korean culture itself. So thank you very much. Without you, this tradition would not exist. Without you, Sung San Sunim would not have been born here. He would not have gone to the West. I would not have been able to meet him, become a student, come to Korea, etc. That's how it works. He was the greatest teacher I have ever met. If I had met anybody greater, I would be there, not here. So, one very important factor of his teaching, that it was simple and clear and to the point, and this point is really connecting to the mind of the person in front of you. You heard these examples from Hungary and Korea. You connect with the person without any form, without any expectation, without any pre prefix ideas, without any notes. Improvise. And that improvisation, that kind of clarity, instinctively convinces people that you are the person that they need to solve their problems. You don't have to advertise anything, anyone. Just be who you truly are as a Buddhist practitioner. And that's when appearance and function, they connect. If appearance and function, they are identical, then the tradition is genuine. If the appearance and function are becoming different over time, it becomes first a little bit dubious, then hypocritical, then totally disintegrated. And that's when people stop believing in it. I want to quote you something which most of you have not read, but I am absolutely certain that it's available in Korean, because it's available in English for many, many decades. And that is a quote from Dostoevsky's great book, The Karamas of Brothers. And so it happens in the book that Jesus Christ himself reappears in 16th century Spain. And people recognize him. They flock to him. He heals the sick. He performs the miracles. He teaches God's wonderful teaching. And of course, the cardinal, who is the great inquisitor, also recognizes him, accuses him of heresy, puts him into prison, and enters his cell. And when he's in his cell, then he tells him exactly why he will be burnt at the stake. Why he is a heretic. And Jesus does not say a single word. He hears out the great inquisitor and accepts his fate, but I will not tell you what the decision was at the very end of the monologue. I will also not, not tell you what Jesus did at the very end of that monologue. Why I brought it here? Because we have an inherent resistance against something very, very new or radical, which turns our lives upside down, or our view of the world upside down. But that's exactly what great masters do. That's exactly what the hypothetical return of Jesus would have done to the Catholic Church in 16th century Spain, and not only there and then, it would have been the same anywhere, anytime, 
after the establishment solidified, which was not really later than the 8th century when the papal state was formed. So, how do we tolerate teachers that turn our lives upside down? How do we go along with the change that becomes ours after we are exposed to some fresh and clear dharma? That is the question that we have to answer. And mostly, we don't want it. We want great masters and teachers to reinforce, to confirm our own views, our own personality, the comfort zone that we are living in. And when it's not happening, we become frustrated and disappointed. As, That's not what I expected from the teacher. Well, the teacher never really teaches what you expect. Whereas it's changed to, to <coughs> such an extent that unless we really have to go to hospital, we don't go there. If we have to go to the dentist, that means we have a toothache, mostly. If we go to hospital, that means we are sick. If we listen to the Dharma, it means we have a problem. And when we refuse the change, that would happen because we were exposed to the Dharma. Then that means that we refuse the treatment from the doctor, we refuse the dentist, we refuse the help that is actually given to us. So prepare for the unexpected and embrace that. We call that don't know in our own tradition. Sengak omnun maun or algo omnun maun in Korean. The mind that has no thinking. That you cannot put into words or into this paper. That is something you should experience and that is the bridge which connects you and an other human being 100%. I had the greatest connection with those with whom I sat for 90 days without saying almost anything. That silence, that oneness is beyond description. You can connect to people at various levels, thoughts, feelings, culture, history, politics, finance. These connections are all bound to name and form. But the connection which is based on our own essence, our own human substance, that connection goes beyond culture, beyond history, beyond name and form. And that kind of view, that kind of connection, that kind of genuine, clear mind is what can save this tradition. That's what we need to accept from those teachers who have it and convey that to us. Because it changes you. It changes your soul, your karma, your life without wanting it, without directly pointing at you, and most of all, without having any agenda. So I think this is plenty for introductory, and I hope that you have many questions that I can answer. Yeah, I have been listening to your Dharma talk whenever possible uh, since many years ago. You still uh, tell us uh, to help Western visitors by saying, how can I help you? May I help you? Uh, based on uh, their want or their need to be here. But does it make sense? Does it, it make sense? It makes sense, but when you say Western visitors, it's like a temple stay program. Yeah. But what I meant is that you are the Dharma teacher mm. and you have students, not only Westerners, mm -hmm. but also Koreans. Oh, that's great. So mm. it's not really just a cultural exchange. Mm -hmm. What I mean is a genuine human approach that somebody is interested in the Dharma mm. and you don't open up the books mm. and start to talk about the four noble uh, truths and the ten, uh, sorry, the twelve links in the chain of dependent origination or the noble eightfold path or the sutras, etc., etc., etc. No. So how can I help you? Yeah. What are you interested in? Do you have any problems that you expect to solve with the Dharma's help? Mm -hmm. And if you have that approach, you can't go wrong. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't have the answer right there, right then, you cannot go wrong. Because you first heard the person out. You first had the person open up. And that is most important. Mm -hmm. If there's no open door, nothing can go in. Mm -hmm. Nothing.
Okay. But that's what you have taught us. I try. Yes. So I, try. I keep in mind, uh, you know, that there was a very strong message. Uh, since I heard uh, from you, I didn't mean or I didn't try to explain what is uh, Buddhism or what the Korean Buddhism was. Mm -hmm. But instead, I tried to help or understand the uh, others' situation, others' uh, needs inside, things like that. We don't need to preach with the Buddhism, uh, knowledge of Buddhism. So uh, they made your your speech, Dharma talk, uh, have, has uh, may, uh, has made us um, uh, to be reasonable, to be understanding, things like that. Well, I will stop that there. But what I want to talk is, uh, I, I am not, we are not pessimistic of Korean Buddhism because of you and uh, because of other Sung San Srim's disciples, uh, whether they live in Korea or abroad. Yes, you are spreading the genuine message of Sung San Srim, uh, which are genuine voices of Buddha. That's why we are happy. We don't have to be so much pessimistic of Korean Buddhism. I will uh, stop here. It's wonderful what you said, but it's not enough. <laughs> uh, I appreciate your kind and uh, very generous approach. But each one of us can be the representative of that teaching. Um, the scientists present a, a very intriguing and mysterious view how this universe was created. Suppose that it came out of the Big Bang as we know it, or presume to know it. At the beginning, it was super hot, super dense, and suddenly it expanded. And for a long time, there were no planets, no galaxies, no clusters, not even matter. And as it cooled down and the speed of increase slowed down, slowly, slowly, dust appeared, small bodies appeared, objects appeared, and then planets, asteroids, moons, stars, galaxies, clusters, black holes, supernovas, quasars, etc. If you look at the way a religion is born, it's pretty much like a spiritual Big Bang. At first, there is just one point, one individual like Jesus or Buddha or Lao Tzu or Sri Ramana Maharishi. They either take all the previous patterns away or they bring a totally new one or both together. Or they renew it with such freshness that it's like something totally absolutely radical. And that's the spiritual Big Bang. Kaboom! In one generation, in the lifetime of the founder, it expands very, very much compared to later expansion when after the death of the founder, it slows down and cools down and people are starting to look for their own planets, creating their own little galaxies, putting everything on orbit on a predictable basis. And within a few hundred years, most of these spiritual Big Bangs became religious views and dogmas and political concerns over finance and power and real estate. What will happen later? So when a new teacher comes and there's a new Big Bang, it takes away most of the previous establishment. And that's why the great inquisitor tells Jesus that you are not necessary here. We don't want you here. We understood your teaching. We have evolved. And we not only give food to some people and keep other people afraid from the wrong path, but we do not need anybody to turn this thing upside down. That's how resistant we are. I appreciate your kindness. But Sung Sanim students 
are not enough. We need more. And that more is that in your heart, this tradition would be born again, would shine again with its original wonderful light of wisdom and compassion. And then we can be this spiritual Big Bang ourselves, renewing the tradition. And I'm not pessimistic either. I'm realistic. And that realism is my fuel. It's my motivation to practice every day. And then when we have a chance, share the Dharma with all of you. More questions? Uh, worldwide, are there many students of Sung San Sinim? I don't know. We believe, I believe I am a student of Sung San Sinim. I think like you that. are. Yeah, there may be many Sung San Sinim's students. Um, how would we know? I think we would know if uh, we had some pretty good results. And one result would be to reduce suffering on this earth below a certain level. We don't see that. And yeah, there may be more and more students of Sung San Sinim students, as we know them. But I would, I would also like to see more of Jinje Sunim students and Song Dam Sunim students and uh, So Chang Sunim students. Many, many great masters could have more and more students. That would be wonderful. Why do we need more and more? Because this world produces suffering quicker than we could take it away. In this world, there are two kinds of suffering. One is that by default comes with the fact that we were born. We were born, we have a human body, that means we have growing pains when we grow up, and after being a grown-up, soon we start to get old and die. So the four misfortunes as turned in the teaching, it's inevitable and it comes with human life. Famine, poverty, hunger, war, deprivation, overexploitation, social inequality, these are all man-made. They do not have to be there, but we make them. The second group we can change, the first group we cannot. But there's something very important. If we get totally preoccupied with the second group, man-made suffering, then we have absolutely no chance to look into the first group, why we are born, why we are here, what happens to us when we die. And most people are very interested in that, but we have to deal with the second group, man-made suffering, all that we do to each other, and that's not necessary. So waking up means that we become truly aware of ourselves as humans, what we are, essentially, and help others attain the same. That's the direction of this question, how may I help you? More questions? In my understanding, you stress the connection uh, between uh, other people and the, my own essence or nature. Uh, my understanding is right. I have some questions. Uh, in daily life, I am now, in my thinking, I am now trying to, uh, when I s see some people, some other people in uh, business world, in any kinds of uh, uh, area, uh, I am trying to uh, show my uh, genuine mind, or uh, pure mind, and so on. In that case, uh, I experienced very, very unexpected reactions. Good. Yeah. <laughs> and in that case, in that situation, uh, I feel some embarrassment. How I can do, uh, deal with this situation? So my question is, uh, when you experience such kind of, uh, such kind of, uh, uh, case and situation when you uh, uh, face, uh, how do you handle this kind of uh, uh, difficult or 
by situation. When you have a genuine display of your pure and clear mind, <laughs> and by the reaction of the other humans, you get embarrassed, we call that head of a dragon, tail of a snake. Don't be embarrassed by my reaction. Keep your center strong. If you go Tanjon practice, especially Tanjon Ho, Tanti and breathing, your center here in your belly will be stronger than your feelings and your understanding. Then you can reflect back other people's reactions and you do not identify with it. That is the key point. If you identify with what people say to you, you will always throw yourself off-road, off somewhere where you don't want to be. And what happened is just somebody told you something or made you feel bad, and you took that upon yourself. You accepted the projection. So if you really display something genuine, that that genuine has to be strong and clear and kind and wise so as to not identify with other people's reactions. Okay? A little more practice necessary. Especially meditation. And if you sit still and you let the movie become clear, then the movie will disappear and this space, this moment, this mind will all be one. And then these reactions cannot hurt you. Such uh, ability or close have to be uh, based on the, my uh, practice. Yes. Yeah. Not your thinking, not your feelings, your practice. Yeah, thank you. So You're much. welcome. More questions? I always have some questions, including me, some on Korean Buddhism. Uh, as you uh, just you said like that some risk of the uh, Korean Buddhism now, but uh, I think always the when uh, it's include me, some of the leaders or some special for the lay people, uh, they say this and behave uh, that, so. Their behavior and their uh, saying is quite different. So it's, uh, it's very difficult to how to understand about the situation. Or, and uh, of course, we have to uh, change the, uh, like that uh, behavior for them. But sometimes we worry about that. So it's a kind of main reason of uh, not spread a lot of our uh, Buddhism in Korea. But I don't know exactly, but I think. So uh, uh, the most important is uh, is include me is to match our words and our behavior. It's wonderful what you say, but you cannot teach people based on the expectation that their speech and their behavior would match. This problem that you mentioned is so big that in our Yebulmun, in our daily chanting, we devote four great bodhisattvas to become one. Kwan Sambosa, number one, responsible for emotions. If you refine your emotions, it becomes compassion. Next is Munsubosa. Munsubosa is responsible for your thinking mind. Your thinking mind becomes clear and refined, it becomes wisdom. Deheng Boyon Bosal is action bodhisattva. That's where your actions are taken care of. And Jijang Bosal, Dewan Bonjan Jijan Bosal is the Bodhisattva of great vow. That vow is done with speech. That's where all your verbal vows and uh, anything that you make 
with your verbal activity. That's where it is. Speech, action, feelings, and thoughts. Human beings, we never have them 100% matching. Look at the way. The way says, originally one mind. One mind. But this one mind has four agents, and the four agents sometimes go totally separate. You look at somebody, and you talk to somebody, and your speech is just reflecting maybe part of your thinking. You never reveal your feelings. General human behavior. It's called self-protection. Then you have something like an action, which you never want to reveal to anybody. Then you will never want to talk about it. Then somebody forces you to talk about it, then you do. So, if you strive for integrity inside, because that's what we're talking about, the matching of thoughts, feelings, words, and speech, that's what we call integrity. But don't expect that in other people. So instead of that, address the conflict, not like a policeman or a doctor or a prosecutor, like a compassionate teacher asking the right question. And if you ask people the right question, pointing at the inconsistency or the opposites or the paradox within them, they will thank you. But it takes skill. It takes trial and error. Sun Chan used to say, don't touch karmic pain point. That means do not just go into people's lives and point at the mistake. Ask a question in such a way that they would feel motivated to correct it. Or at least they could see it and leave them the choice what they want to do with it. In our Kongan practice, we always have very simple interviews. And uh, what happens is we always say, what is the nature of this cup? Then there is an answer. What is the nature of this phone? Then there is an answer. Then we ask, phone and cup, same or different? In that case, you can ask your action and your speech. Are they the same or are they different? Then, touche. Then the person has to see something. You didn't say right or wrong. You didn't judge the person, but you asked the right question. Right. You. You're welcome. More questions? Well, there are many, many religions in this world. Uh, I would like to say that, uh, you know, major religions like Christian and uh, Muslim. Well, Christian in Korea, uh, some Christians very, very aggressive for, you know, that uh, missionaries. They just say, believe Christ. Yeah. Then you go to paradise. Yeah. If not, you go to, you know, that hell. That's very a very simple, simple very, very strong simple. approach. Yeah. And also that uh, Muslim, uh, I, you know, that uh, learned in uh, books, they that uh, approach like this. One hand the Quran, the other hand the sword. If you not believe the Quran, I will kill you. Very strong and a very simple approach. Simple, strong to the yes. yes. And in Buddhism, I don't know what is that uh, simple and uh, strong approach for foreigner. If you have any idea, oh, yeah. please tell me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you relax, you will be happy. Your mind is tight, you will suffer. What do you want? <laughs> More seriously, you go beyond life and death, death, you attain awakening and true freedom. You are attached to I, my, me, you create hell for yourself and others. I think that this is also simple enough. But do not say that to foreigners. They will not like you. Do you think people like it when you say, believe or I kill you? Or believe heaven, not believe hell. People don't like that. People want their own choice. So the best is when somebody is interested in Buddhism, maybe vaguely or tentatively, then you ask, what do you really want? What do you want? It will happen. Whatever you want will happen. And if you're not aware of what you want, then it will happen without you being aware of it. So maybe awareness helps to Clarify for yourself what you want. And work with people's desire. Work with people's anger. 
Work with people's ignorant views and don't discard them. And then they will accept you. And then you can help them. Because at the very beginning, they are like children playing with their toys in the burning house. And most of these very strong religions, in fact, they lock the door and they leave. So people keep being in the burning house, more and more angry, more and more frustrated, etc., etc. Very few dare to open the door and say, you have to leave your toys behind. Come out and leave the burning house. If you want. If you don't want, you can burn in there. No problem. Inside your heart is broken. We are bodhisattvas. We have compassion. But compassion does not mean you take away other people's freedom. Never. You want to do harm to yourself? I'm standing by with the first aid kit to help you when you bleed. But I will not stop you. That's adult. Not keeping people children. Let them grow up. Let them make mistakes. Let them entertain wrong views. No problem. But when they suffer, you're the first to help when they have real suffering, you know? You know how many times people came up to say, Jesus loves you! And I said, Jesus loves you too. <laughs> you must follow me! You must follow us! No, no, no. We follow Jesus. We don't follow any church. And that's why you can ask, church and Jesus, same or different? <laughs> Plenty of chance. Plenty of chance. So I'm optimistic. More questions? Well, by the way, uh, what did you say to the men who were rude? Uh, On the subway, I yeah, yeah, in yeah, Hungarian. Yeah, yeah. I said to him, well, if you approach people with compassion, you will get compassionate response in return. But if you project your own wrong views, soon somebody will be aggressive to you. And then you will have suffering. And I don't think you can stop that with this current mind state. I feel sorry for you. And he felt that. I'm not his enemy. I actually perceived him better than he perceived himself. And that's why he was afraid. One important quality that all of you must have when you deal with students, that you know them better than they know themselves. And that's what makes you a teacher in their eyes. And you don't have to know their personal history. You don't have to read their minds. You have to connect to their heart. And this kind of connection with your experience as a human being and a practitioner brings more value to that person's life than books this thick. Okay? More questions? What is the different point of the between Theravada Buddhism of Vipassana and Korean hard meditation. And also, just before you told, you know the very well Korean Buddhism situation, and just before you told, the Tibetan Buddhism is, is more popular in the world. So, how to promote Korean Buddhism in the world? Uh, I quote the Dalai Lama first. He says, I'm not a Buddhist. I don't have any, any religion. I only teach kindness. Kindness is the first approach which people want and they believe you if you're kind to them. Now it's our job to have sincerity behind kindness. We understand kindness can have many many agendas behind it but if you are sincere, genuine and kindness at the same time that's pretty much irresistible. So uh, without expectations Kindness and sincere inquiry into a person's problem, that's the number one approach that they had to learn. They were chased out of their country. They were invaded, decimated, tortured, killed, 14,000 monasteries blown up. They scattered all over the globe, including India, United States, Europe, everywhere. And for survival, they had to use the best they had. The best they had was their own Buddhist tradition. So what does it take for Korean Buddhism to adopt the same behavior? I hope it's not an invasion. I hope it's not some big personal and collective tragedy. 
I hope this doesn't happen. Chulga means leaving home. It's not just for individuals. It's also for a tradition. So Tibetans were forced into a collective chulga, leaving home, and adapt to the world intelligently, helpful, and compassionate way. So I suggest that just like Sung San Sunim took the Dharma abroad, which was an act of Korean Buddhism making a chulga, an act of leaving home, do the same. Leave home with the tradition. Do not carry all the luggage of your own personal belongings mentally. Take the essence of that tradition abroad. And that will help. That will renew you, it will renew the tradition, and it will help everybody whom you meet. Other questions? Anyone? Uh, it's just, it, it was a great time to understand um, the worldly Buddhism uh, situation. Um, you explained that Tibetan Buddhism is the uh, most popular uh, Buddhism in the, in the By world. By statistics, yes. Yeah. So I have a question to you. Um, if 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 the Tibetan Buddhism derived the essence from their tradition um, in the religious religious way, um, that that must be have uh, strengths in practice and belief. Yeah. Uh, compared with Korean Buddhism, why do you believe? and practice in Korean way on the Because Sung Sun. San Suning's Dharma helped my mind 24 years ago. I could solve the problem with his help. His presence, his teaching, the form that he brought was exactly what I needed to put my mind back to correct function, back to wholesome function, back to normalcy. I owe a great deal of gratitude, loyalty, to him and to Koreans who are upholding that tradition. So that strength comes from that experience. That loyalty comes from being involved in it for 24 years and 20 years out of that as a monk. So I think everybody's personal experience should be what counts. So strength in practice cannot just be for years out of somebody's convincing you If you practice, you must have some experience which changes your mind, which leads you to the fundamentals of your being. And that is something you can invoke in others. You can encourage in others, first by good questions, then by correct teaching on practice. And then they have that experience which makes them say, this is it. I love this tradition because it helped me so much. It's a very really di different question. Sure. Uh, after dying, what do you imagine? Uh, <laughs> after dying, uh, uh, the, the future of our uh, situation is very uh, difficult to imagine. So, uh, what if we don't imagine? How, how about starting with that? <laughs> We don't imagine. <laughs> We have this wonderful practice with the Huadu, with the deep question, what is this? Ige Shinga. That is something which is beyond life and death. You attain that, you have no problem. So, I know it's not enough. You need something more to hold on to. So, that which is clarified by the question, what is this? What am I? That is something which is beyond life and death. Now, that's really the foundation, the alpha and the omega of your being. That's your true nature. Now, once you practice that, everything else becomes clear. The problem is not that we wouldn't have so many books and words and teaching about the kind of post-life states. The problem is you don't know what to believe. You go to Kyobo Mungo and you get 200 books at least on near-death experience, uh, organ transplant, residual memories, uh, out-of-body experiences, uh, previous life uh, memories, all kinds of stuff. How to make sense of all that? How to put that to the right place? 
Only your own mind, your intuitive, clear mind can decide without thinking which one is true, which one is not true. Somehow it has to relate to your experience. Somehow it has to connect to you. Now your job and every one of us' job is to open up this kind of gate, this kind of connection that we could genuinely see clearly what is true and what is not true. Most of the great teachers, they didn't have to read books for these experiences. Some of us have partway experience, partway reading. And if your experience is clear, you can make sense of what you read and you can build them together. That can be strong and clear. But if the experience is not clear, then you take the wrong understanding and the wrong words and it becomes this mix and match and uh, really not so good combination. We call that bad stomach in the mind. It's just a bad mix. You can feel that sometimes. People are going around, around, around. Mind is always moving, always checking something, always trying to understand more and more and more. Not unmoving, not clear. Not simple. So it's for you to find out. I will not take away your own experience in that round. <laughs> I just told you how to proceed on the way. Okay? You're welcome. Other questions? Well, you are here last year. Uh -huh. You were here last year, yeah. and uh, you look much, much better than last year. What <laughs> happened to, to you Imagine within a what year? happens next year. <laughs> next year may be even better. <laughs> what happened to you during last year? I don't know. <laughs> what I know is that I became one year older. Maybe that helped. You look much healthier. <laughs> And, Go on. Uh, yeah, uh, strong, smiling, much smiling. Uh, smiling. Yeah. <laughs> uh, give us good feelings. Uh, I try, uh, but what I can tell you that practice has a maturity time. Sometimes you practice and there is not much result, and sometimes you practice a little, and all the energy that you put in there previously, it suddenly comes out. That practice energy is like a deposit in a bank. So day in and day out, we practice, we are Buddhists. At least one mantra in the morning. You don't have to sit for too long. You're working. Sometimes monks and nuns are also busy. But you put your mind on the right track, first thing in the morning. And when your mind is on the right track, doesn't matter how much formal practice you did, especially on that day, you do not fool yourself. Therefore, others also have, a le have less chance to fool you. So this kind of practice, if you combine it with as much formal practice as possible, in the long run, it has results. And sometimes your karma hits you like a Mack truck and you want to die and you feel weak and you feel terrible, and etc. That's all okay. Seven times fall down, eight times get up. That's us. That's on Wilgo. That's our tradition. So I'm not sure what's going to happen to me next year. <laughs> maybe dead, maybe alive, maybe looks better, maybe looks worse. What I know that none of us in this room is getting any younger. No matter how we feel or how we look at others, time is running out. Once you reach a certain point, not necessarily a midpoint in your life, you realize that you will live less than what you lived so far. And that doesn't have to scare you. It just makes you more serious. It just makes you also a little bit more humorous. Maybe it activates some of your unknown strengths, which you have not used before. This incarnation is really, really short. One lifetime is like a flicker of a candle. 
And uh, if we don't make some sense out of it, we could fall the abyss of many, many wrong views. Our tradition is wonderful because you attain the true nature of this world, including yourself. You go through the maze, the labyrinth of all the wrong views, anger and greed, and you, and you can become clear. If not, your karma can wrap you up, completely envelope you, and you don't see the path out of it. And when you see the path, when you instinctively feel what to do, what to say, what kind of feelings and thoughts you have, you're happy. And that happiness translates into your life. And that's wonderful. We accept that originally things do not come and go. They are not good and bad. They have the nature of emptiness. We give all the characteristics to it. And if you accept that originally nothing, then soon you have everything. Everything because you and this world become one. You took yourself, your ego, out of the way. So you yourself disappeared. No more hindrance. So attain the true nature of our being beyond name and form, beyond life and death. Attain the six patriarchs originally nothing. And then we have everything. So I hope from time to time we can come together share the Dharma with each other, practice, practice, and practice so as to answer the questions of everybody who resorts to the Dharma, wake up and save all beings from suffering. Thank you very much for your attention.